Today I want to give this morning and this afternoon to the study of another identifying mark of the church of which we read in our own Bibles. We've been doing that because there is a church that you read about in the New Testament. Does it exist today? If it doesn't exist, can it exist? And by studying these marks of the church, these identifying marks of the church, then we can know whether a church is the one that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, and Acts chapter 2, or if it doesn't exist around us by the study of His goodwill and our loving desire to obey Him, we can put into practice in our lives those things that will cause the church to exist on this earth. That's the reason we have a Bible, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, is to lead us and to guide us and direct us in all things spiritual in service to God. Now, I want to look at this identifying mark in two parts, as I said earlier. First is laying the background for what will be more specifically dealt with this afternoon. We're talking about blood and its significance and its involvement in the unfolding of the scheme of redemption as you read your Bible and especially as you're reading in the Old Testament. Because in all ages there has been efficacy or effectiveness in procuring power in blood. It's always been represented that way. Some people who say, well, you're going back to the dark ages and you're pagan in your attitude thinking about blood that way. But routinely we hear it said of our fighting men, of the soldiers, how much they have shed their blood for this country, how they have given their lives for this country. And to say one has given his blood or given his life is to say the same thing. So it still sends forth the same message. It sends forth a message of sacrifice and service. Thus, when you begin to read through the Old Testament, all 39 books, whether it's dealing in the patriarchal age, the father rule period from Genesis 1-1 to the giving of the law to the Jews through Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20, all through the Old Testament, you see blood emphasized in the plan for man's sins to be forgiven. There's a reason for that, Ed, and it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 23. Said other places, but here you find a restatement of the law by Moses to the children of Israel just before they went in under Joshua, before his uh, Moses' death, to take the land of Canaan. And it reads, For the blood is the life. When you partake of the fruit of the vine in the observance of the Lord's Supper, it is emblematic of the blood Jesus shed on Calvary's cross from His body. It is emblematic of His giving His life, and sometimes we say it this way, his life's blood. Now you had the whole Old Testament preparing man's mind to understand the sacrifice necessary to save us from even one single solitary sin. Back over in Genesis chapter 4, Abel brought forth the first things of the flock, a sacrifice to the Lord. He offered it by faith, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, which means God had instructed him, and thus he complied with that instruction. Faithful Abraham, who is called by James because of his faith in God, an obedient faith, a friend of God, understood the importance of offering a bloody sacrifice to God. 
And when his faith was put to supreme test, take thy son, thine only son, thy son whom thou lovest, and offer him a burnt offering to me. He went through all but stabbing the child, if you want to call it that, all but the actual act of killing him. And God supplied an animal for that. Genesis 22, 1 through 19. When you come down to the time that Israel is about to be delivered out of the land of Egypt, the land of bondage, you see that the Passover feast was created. And you find that this is said of those who would be in the houses where they would put the blood on the doorpost and the mantle. In Exodus 12, 13, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And there shall no plague be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Thus, that was a shadow of the actual act of God through Christ in giving His Son to die for us. And it pointed to the time that we as the church, the purchased of God by that blood, would observe the Lord's Supper in memory of the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, as John the forerunner of the Christ proclaimed Him, Jesus Christ. We also see why that at the end of the world, those who do not believe and obey the gospel, where God's located his saving power, Romans 1.16, must suffer, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1.7 and 8, when he comes again in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So just as the blood for the Israelites allowed them to escape the death of the firstborn in all of Egypt, then so the blood of Christ, when applied as the gospel applies it to us by our choice to believe and obey it, then we shall be spared on that day, for none of these things shall touch us. Thus you see pictured in symbolic language in Revelation 2.14, that should cause a great joy to swell up within us as we especially engage in worship of God today to be able someday to stand among those who, to use the inspired language of John, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You also notice when it comes to the covenants, the Old and New Testament, that the sealing of the covenants with blood is another way of bearing testimony to the importance of blood in the divine scheme of redemption, man being redeemed from his sins. You notice that the children of Israel did express a desire to keep the ordinances that Moses had received from God. Though they went back on that, there were those who did keep them. Burnt offerings and peace offerings went up before the Lord and the blood of these particular animals was used to seal the covenant between God and man, which was the Old Testament covenant or the mosaical economy for the Jews. Deuteronomy 5 verses 1 through 5. And we have a description of that ceremony, which we won't read right now, in Exodus 24 verses 6 through 8. Now, it's interesting to see the writer of Hebrews writing to Christians who were Jews. Remember, they were being tested. They were being persecuted for their faith in Christ. And they were actually thinking about giving up the New Testament system and going back under the law of Moses. And the writer of Hebrews will refer to Exodus 24, 6 through 8 and uh, refer to that ceremony, Hebrews 9, verses 19 through 20, showing how that this covenant, the New Testament of Christ, was sealed with blood also. So all of that sealing of blood of the Old Testament covenant was a shadow or a type of the sealing with the blood of Christ of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. He said, this is my blood of the New Testament 
which is shed for remission of sins for you. Notice what it said in Hebrews 9, 21 and 22. How that all things under the Mosaic economy was sanctified with blood. Moreover, he writes, the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry he sprinkled in like manner with the blood. And according to the law, I may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And apart from shedding of blood, there is no remission. We also see that the Jewish system, as you well know, had all kinds of animal sacrifices. There is no way to measure the amount of lambs and goats and doves and pigeons and bullocks that were offered over that 1,500 year period in which Israel approached God through the law of Moses. We have some writing that's outside the scripture that tells us some about that that on the high days of Israel offering sacrifices after the temple was built that the blood would be flowing so much that it would cascade down the steps now you know that's pretty abhorrent to us uh, but you know we live in such a nice age we live in such a far removed from such things as that. Death of our own family members is removed from us considerably when it used to be a family thing from the time they suffered and breathed their last till they were put in the ground. The family and close friends did it. Not anymore. And so it is with so many things about our society, but it wasn't then. That Israelite picked his best blue ribbon championship lamb because that's what he would give to God if he was faithful. And he knew that innocent, dumb animal was going to die because of his sins. And so they gave them by the multiplied thousands. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never, with the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect them that draw nigh. Else would they have not ceased to be offered. Because the worshipers, having been once cleansed, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, those under the law of Moses, done by the Jews, there is a remembrance made of sins year by year. For, he's going to tell you why. It's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. But they pointed to what the forerunner Christ, John the Immerser, would say when Jesus came. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So those same sacrifices year by year, Hebrews 10, 3, had to be continually offered under that old covenant. But again, all the blood of animals shed on Israel's altars could not expiate one single solitary sin. So then what was the reason for such? It was too in the mind of the offerer of the sacrifice to move the weight of sin forward. Saying that the actual act by the one who could do it and the only one who could do it had not yet been done. Now, they received the benefits of Christ's death on the cross because they were faithful to the law God had given them. But there could actually be no forgiveness till Christ died. But when God said he would, Isaiah chapter 53, then God did. That's called in Hebrew a Hebrew prophetic perfect. He speaks of it having been done when it was years before it happened. Because what God proposed, he took care of. And their faith in God under the law and things like we've just read caused them then to believe that such would happen and that faith then allowed the blood of Christ to go backward and forgive them as it comes forward 2,000 years to forgive us and however forward it needs to go in the gospel before he comes again. In Hebrews chapters 9 and 10, 
And of course, we won't take time to read those chapters. I urge you to do so. We have a clear and forceful analogy with reference to the blood of animals and the blood of Christ. Now, let's look at some of these things to give emphasis to them. Because remember, this sermon this morning, and it'll be more brief than some I deliver in the morning, <laughs> because I'm going to finish it this afternoon. It is designed to show that there always has been blood involved in the divine scheme of things when it comes to the forgiveness of man's sins. You had 2,500 years of the patriarchal age. And if you read through that, you can virtually follow the lives of these men who were held up as great faithful servants of God. Read many of them in Hebrews 11. By the altars of sacrifice, they erected wherever they went. And of course, we've already mentioned what goes on and what went on under the law of Moses for the Jews. First of all, let's emphasize this, to show, to show the importance of blood throughout the Old Testament history, the unfolding the scheme of redemption. The first covenant was dedicated by blood, and likewise, then the new covenant, the New Testament, was blood sealed. In Hebrews 10.3, we learned that the Israelites had the weight of sin move forward, as I just said a few moments ago, by the offering of sacrifices year by year. But for us today, when you comply with God's terms of pardon in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which remember is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16, the moment you are baptized into Christ and rise from that watery grave of baptism, God in His mind has forgiven you every past sin and you rise a new creature in Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Under the old law, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies each year, most holy place each year, the tabernacle and then the temple. And Hebrews chapter 9, 7 reads, which he offered for himself, that is blood. He went in with blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors or the sins of the people. So he typified in the high priest's work the actual coming of what Christ would do. Christ, who is our sinless high priest, the only mediator between God and man, as Paul said it, the man, Jesus Christ, didn't offer the bloods of blood of animals for sin. He had no sin. What was he going to offer for sin? But he offered his own precious blood for man's sins. And then with the merit of that blood, ascended into heaven to appear before God and receive a kingdom and sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high. All of that, groundwork for that, is laid in the Old Testament. You would do yourself a disservice in understanding the Old Testament as you read it if you don't take note of that point starting from Genesis right on down through Malachi and the significance of it. It's all a part of handling aright the word of truth as you study to show yourself approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15. It causes even more of an appreciation on a person's part that I cannot save myself. Nothing in this world can save me from sin. Only God and His ordained way can save me from my sins because my sins ultimately and finally are against God. And sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3 verse 4. That's what separates me from God. You cannot die separated from God and somebody then write truthfully R.I.P as you see so often on the social media. A fellow could be a drunk and kill 500 people and die and somebody would say R.I.P. 
They don't know what they're saying. They don't think of what they're saying. They don't understand what's necessary in a person's life for when he dies for one to honestly and truthfully say, rest in peace. There is no peace for the one who dies outside of Christ because all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are located in one place, in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.3. And if you're not in Christ, there's only one other place you can be, outside of Christ, where there is no forgiveness of sins, where there is no remission. And the blood of Christ stands between us and receiving that remission. How so? Well, if it's not applied, how can you be washed by it? When we talk about being washed clean in baptism, we're not talking about the water. Save in this, that we're to be baptized in water. And thus, showing our obedience to God, we comply with it. But what washes us clean is the blood of Jesus Christ. And it continues to cleanse us as members of the church faithfully serving Him. For if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, where do we contact that blood in the first place? When we were baptized into the death of Christ, for in the death of Christ He shed His blood, Romans 6, 3 and 4. And we were buried with Him in baptism. We had died to sin, if you please, at the point of repentance. You don't bury a live body, you bury a dead body. And thus we were buried with our Lord in baptism. And we're raised to walk in newness of life because that baptism is a baptism for unto in order to a given point, And that is the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. Thus when Paul, a believer who had repented of sins was confronted by the gospel preacher the Lord had selected and sent to him. And Ananias, that preacher, found out the state of Paul. He said, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Notice, calling on the name of the Lord. You know how you call on the name of the Lord? It's not by saying, Lord, save me. It's by complying with what he's authorized and that for the alien sinner is to comply with every step in the plan of salvation to the final step, and that is baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3.27. That's why Peter, who said to those on Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of sins, said years later in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism doth also now save us. Well, it does or it doesn't. And the Holy Scripture says it does. Now Why? Because of the blood of Christ. So we bring this lesson this morning to a close by simply saying the conclusion is, as the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 9.22, apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Can you get plainer than that? Apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Do you see now just from that statement and view also of what we've said, I hope this morning, why blood plays such a significant part in the salvation of the sins of men. Forgiveness of sins. So if you need to obey the gospel, then I urge you, I plead with you by the mercies of Christ to do so this morning. And if a child of God, you're not living as the New Testament says, then we urge you to repent of those sins, confess them, pray God for forgiveness that you might once be restored to your first love. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.